Okay, everyone. So uh, first things first, let's see if it works. Perfect. I can hear myself and the lag is minimal at least when I start the stream. So that's actually pretty great. So thank you for coming. And I will be showing two things today, which is uh, first it will be um, a web challenge, which is partly basically a file format challenge. And the second thing is uh, a crack me, which was created by Bart, which is a rather known reverse engineer in Poland. And I didn't look at it before, so I expect it will actually stretch out to even the next streams. So I will start today, but then we'll see. Um, so, okay, a couple of things. As you, okay, before I get to that, um, I'd like to thank Nervous Test Pilot, as always, for providing the music and uh, allowing me actually to use it. So thanks, man. His music is really great for coding. So I recommend you try it out. It's again Nervous Test Pilot. Then I would like to thank my moderator, Kshaku. Um, this, is, this is the way you spell it, it's actually Kshaku. And if you have any questions at any time and you are either on the chat of live coding or you are on the chat, our IRC chat, we also have an IRC channel, which you can, well, you can see, I guess, here at the, at the bottom. Just tell Kshaku that you have a question and I actually hear him, we are on a voice chat and he will tell me, hey, there's a question, you should look, you, you should answer it. So I'll do that. Um, again, Kshaku, thank you for being here, for helping me with the streams. Um, apart from that, uh, you probably know I have a Twitter channel, you probably are here because you saw that my Twitter channel and my messages there, or you saw, um, well, the post on Reddit. Anyway, I did make a pool last time after the stream, uh, which is, I believe, this is it. And I asked you guys, what do you think? Should we stay on live coding or should we switch to YouTube? So the origin of this, of this question is actually that my Polish streams, I do them on YouTube. I started on live coding, then I went to Twitch for a couple of sessions, then to YouTube, and then I made like a huge poll. Uh, and asked my users for feedback and asked them like, which one do you like? And they said that YouTube is probably the best due to a couple of reasons. One is quality, the other is, um, well, for example, uh, you can scroll back, you can rewind during the stream. And that was, uh, these were the arguments. So I actually am doing a similar thing with these streams. I'm not going to try Twitch because Twitch uh, seems to be like the worst platform for this kind of stuff, because unless you have like a huge viewership, you are not a Twitch partner and a lot of features are not available to you. And uh, well, this is a reverse engineering stream. So, you know, it's not huge viewership in terms of like Counter-Strike or anything else which is streamed on Twitch. Anyway, so I'm going to make another poll today probably, and I will ask you guys, anyone who is on chat, like, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer live coding or should we try YouTube? And I ask, also will ask you for feedback in the blog post on my um, blog. I will basically, like, if you go to my blog, uh, there will be here another blog post, as was uh, on the previous session, after the first session there was, I got some feedback. If you have any opinion after this session on live coding or on YouTube switch, or YouTube switch, please, please, please go to my blog and um, under the new post, which will appear or under the new uh, the news post about this session, please let me know what do you think about li live coding, especially does everything work for you smoothly? Did you have any problems running it? Uh, were there any lags? Were there any breakage in watching the video, basically? Um, I know there are a couple of issues, like for example, the quality of the sound isn't perfect. That being said, I got a message um, from, from other site owners that uh, this will be boosted to, to a better bitrate basically in two, three weeks. So this will change. Uh, then another thing is that mm, there is actually on live coding both a Flash player and an HTML5 player. The HTML5 player is said to be more stable, but to run it, you actually have to fully disable Flash in your browser. So if you go to you know, extension settings and disable flash and then refresh the live coding page, it should show you the HTML5 player, which is said to be better. So if you have any issues, you can try that. Um, so yeah, basically after this, please let me know what, what do you think and um, whether we should stay here or whether we should, we should move on and try YouTube instead. Uh, also, as I mentioned, we have an IRC channel, so feel free to, yeah, to, to join us on Gunvale stream dash en on Freenode. You can ask questions and you can, there's also like a active community. Well, not a huge community, but on the Polish channel, there's a huge community and, but I guess the one on the English channel will be growing as well. 
So without further ado, let's get to today's topic topics. And um, as you did see, I did have something here else and it was called zip slides, something like this, slides. Mm -mm. So, okay, yeah. This is actually a talk which I never did in, which I never did in English publicly. I did it like for one company, but um, it's a talk about my research on zips. I did like some really reading into the zip format, testing different clients and, and so on. And I, I did publish the English version of the slides, which uh, you can download, it's like a PDF or something. And uh, and there's also a recording from a Polish video with sadly no subtitles in English. I mean, if anyone would, anyone would be interested, I, I can actually read you this in English on the stream sometime in the future. But being said, why am I chatting about it? I'm chatting about it because in the next challenge that I'm going to show, which was uh, created by Emlen from Dragon Sector from my team, was uh, actually based on my research. So I'm pretty familiar with what's going to happen. And if you want details and you will get lost uh, by like, and, and the things I talk about, you will like, uh, for some reason, don't understand what I'm saying, which which is pretty probable if you don't know Zip too well. Then just go there, uh, read through the slides and see maybe if this will get you up to date and up to speed with what's going on. So, okay, let's start with it. I will uh, I need to ask still Emlen if he wants to make this change publicly available, therefore I have it set up currently only on, uh, on my web server. I'm going to be using Firefox, uh, so the start of this change is basically a web challenge. Again, if you just came and if you have qu any questions, then ask Kshaku on either on, um, uh, what's it called, on live coding chat. Okay, he's set to, to moderator, perfect. Or you can ask him on, on our IRC and uh, he will tell me that there is a question, I will try to answer it. Okay, and I will be using Fiddler. Um, so Fiddler is basically like a web debugger, which, which means it's a web proxy, uh, same, similar to Burp, similar to um, Zap, if you're, if you're familiar with that. So it just shows you basically the HTTP packets, which are flowing back and forth, and it will also be able to manipulate them and resend them to the server, or like catch them in the middle and, and change them. These are like pretty basic uh, features, which both Burp, bo both Fiddler, and both Zap have. And I'm not going to use it too much actually today, but but it will be running as a proxy in the background. So, okay, I have this Zippy challenge set up on a virtual machine, which is a Ubuntu server. Actually, I'm not sure if it's like an exact replica. Um, yeah, as you can see, like I use this browser a lot for, for like competitions. I wonder how secret this is. I hope it's not too secret. Um, okay, 100, 2, and 6, perfect. Yeah, so this is the challenge, this is how it looks like. It's basically like a website where, which is called Zip Explorer. And um, you can upload files, which, well, it says you should upload zips. We will obviously try otherwise. And you can see the files you've already uploaded. So, okay, let's, let's get this started, maybe. Um, let me maybe create a new console. Oh, there are actually questions because uh, as I did mention, I do have this like funny configuration where I have like, this is my Windows console. It's actually ConEmu, con -emu, which is, uh, I don't know, there's like some about window here. Mm, I don't know, maybe there is, but it's like ConEmu, which is a wrapper on the default Windows console. It's based on Pate engine. It's pretty awesome actually for, for Windows console. But I also have like, a Linux VM work in the background, which uh, is actually, if, if you see, it's actually like have the disks mapped. So being on, on Windows, I can just type L-CMD L and it spawns the Linux genome terminal console. And it's like full blown Linux is Ubuntu running on a virtual machine, but this is displayed on a Windows X server. If um, if you're, I actually found this configuration like super useful and, and great for CTFs. It's perfect because it has like both, uh, best of both worlds. Now, somebody asked me, like a couple of people actually asked me like, uh, so um, how, how do I do this for myself? And um, I actually have the scripts for most of this on my GitHub. If you go to my GitHub, which is well, obviously GitHub slash Genvale, what else? Then there's something called iFace, which is like for interface. And uh, 
just uh, read this part and there's a documentation like a Google Docs document, which uh, outlines a step after a step after a step on of how to configure it. And th this is, th these are my notes. This is like not a perfect how to do it. These are just my notes on how to set it up. So it's treated like an alpha or anything else like that. And on GitHub, this is actually my RPC interface that I use, for example, to, 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 to be able to invoke the LCMD and a couple of other stuff. So there you have it. It's, it's not difficult to set it up. Um, <laughs> so no, it's iFace from interface, not from like uh, iPad or iPhone or whatever else. It's, uh, it's unrelated. Um, sweet. So, um, okay, um, what do we upload? Let's upload something funny. Let's create, start with creating a file. I'm actually, I, I didn't, I probably mentioned I have like four monitors set up uh, in somewhat um, like a spaceship cockpit, cockpit manner. So I'll be creating files on another uh, display. Uh, well, actually naming the files on another display, but I will be dragging them here. Let's start by creating a file which is asdf.php and do like PHP info. And let's try to upload it and see what happens, right? Because like, if we can upload a PHP file and get it to run, then that's game over. And this is, uh, this will be probably the fastest challenge ever. So let's try if it works. And uh, I need to brow browse it. And uh, this is a file and upload failed. Okay, well, no is no. So uh, let's do another thing. Let's actually like pack this file, so zip asdf zip and asdf.php.php and why do you dislike me adsf oh, because i made a typo so perfect now i have this asdf.zip and let's try to upload this but upload also failed so um actually it kind of good that it's failed because uh, you might know or you might not know but i will get to this you can actually if you find a bug which is like a local file inclusion or something like that you might be able to execute php files from within a zip file that's a feature of php which is not widely known but it is there um so okay then let's i don't know let's just create another random file like asdf.txt put something there, whatever, and now pack it. And I am going to name it XXX zip. Okay, it's stored. It's stored meaning it's not deflated, it's not compressed. And I'm going to select this and upload. And upload successful. So if I click this now, I can see actually my files here, right? And it's, well, asdf.txt and something, something. Um, there might be an, might or might not be, an, you know, XSS here. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem we are able to send any messages to any admins or any other stuff like that. So this challenge is probably not about an XSS. So we need to figure out how to how to pwn it. Um, now, when I actually clicked here, you can, I, I do hope you can see it, um, but there is, uh, I'm gonna maybe to create a notes document so you can see it in a bigger font. Yeah. So this is the URL and there's like this P equals something and the obvious thing here is to try if this is, uh, if you can do any local file inclusion attacks there. So a couple of obvious things to try. If you do the same thing and let's, let's assume that files is the name of a file of, or it's a beginning of a name of a file. If you do like dot slash, like it would be a file in the local directory and it still loads correctly when you, you might be onto something or it might just remove any funny characters. So let's see what happens if I do that. Uh, okay, Shaku says there's a question. What was the objective of this zip task um, just to execute your code on the server? So basically, um, okay, so it's a CTF challenge, meaning you, you have to, you get a, you get a link to the service and you, what you have to do is you have to find the flag. So you can do it any way you love, any way you like, but, um, in the end, usually you do have to execute some code to get the flag, unless the flag is in some database or something like that. But usually you do have to go for like full own it and grab, get to the server, have a shelver and, and or run the code there. So uh, let's do dot slash and it still works. It still displays the same thing as in the list of the files, which is, which is good. It means probably adverse like an, um, an injection here. So one thing we can try, we can see if there's like a, is there a files 
file as and if we actually enter this URL, does it display as a file? It doesn't. Maybe there's like .php. It is. So there is this. It's it probably like it takes this and it uh, adds .php. It's like basic stuff, right? And it is did display as some error, so it probably did not expect to be included directly like this, but um, we don't really care at this point. So what can we do? We can try to leak files. Um, how do we leak files? Well, we can actually we can do a couple of things here because we already have a local file inclusion. So which means we can probably try some local file inclusion tactics to grab any mm, grab a file which we control the content of on the disk and then include this and therefore therefore have our our code executed. Now, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I actually um, some time ago I made a funny paper. Well, it wasn't funny in like comedy sense, but it was yeah. Um, PHP LFI arbitrary code. Uh, sorry, it's here. PHP LFI arbitrary code execution. Blah blah blah. But if you actually open this PDF, there is um, a list of ideas how to how to change local file inclusion into probable code execution. And including uploaded files is one thing. So we will get to the, that in a moment. Then we can try to include like uh, data or. Uh, PHP input. This is actually something we should try in a moment, and this is because, well, we do know that mm, dot PHP is added at the end of whatever we type there, but uh, it might not be a problem if we try an approach similar to this. Maybe not PHP input, maybe PHP something else. But there are a couple of like, uh, yes, uh, especially the PHP filter thing. Let's open. Is it a proper URL? Can I click it? No, I cannot click it. That's an. an that's not good. Then there are the log files, right? So we can like send basically a request to, the, you, to a file which doesn't exist and put your code there and then you can include the log files, like the error files from Apache. And um, well, it will load the log files as PHP code in the end and look for PHP tags and execute any code which is there. So this is useful, but the extension added at the end makes this method actually not, it will not be working for us. Then in case of CGI scripts, you can also include this file, which is environment, and you can um, like create any, send any header, for example, your code in an additional HTTP header, and it will be in the environment variables, which will get executed. So this is another way of doing it. Then there are session files. If you have a session file and you can kind of manipulate something like this, for example, a language setting in the session file, you can put your code instead of a language and it will get written to the file. You can try to include the file, the session file, because they are like created, for example, in dash TMP, sorry, slash TMP directory. And uh, you can have your code there, it's just a text file in the end. So, yeah, so that's one thing. Uh, well, it's not actually a text file, I think it's like a serialized stuff. But yeah, uh, and uh, another thing which is described in this directory is actually like uploading files. So if you can upload file, then there's a slight time window where you can include the temporary file which the PHP engine creates for you. So the scripts, um, the, the script can actually like grab this file and copy it somewhere. Now you can actually include this file and there is even a better paper made by some, by some other pay, uh, person based on this research. He said that if you have PHP info, you actually have the name of this randomly created temporary file and super easy to include. But we are not going to go that way, we are going to focus on PHP filter because this is probably the easiest way to um, to leak at least the source code. Maybe not execute it, but at least we can, we can try to leak it. So um, what do we do? We go to PHP manuals, obviously, and uh, PHP filters are actually mm, <laughs> super hard to find. This is one thing I learned about it, is that I, I, I am never able to find the right the right PHP manual because this is not what I'm looking for. So I'm going to actually type exactly what I need and I need PHP filter convert base64. It's something when I was working on a CTF challenge, it's something that I needed to, I found it faster looking through PHP source code than like for registered filters than actually like looking the manuals. So okay, this is like the first link from Google actually when I typed uh, PHP filter convert base64 encode and uh, it shows you this thing. Um, where is it? 
sorry, I wanted to open the notes document. This is not what I wanted. Okay, this is probably the best feature of Windows 10. Yeah, so what we do here, we will do something like this. We will include this PHP. It's actually like a, a scheme, right? So it's a new protocol and it will invoke a filter and then we define what, what filter do we want to inc um, invoke. And this is, uh, we will want to, well, this filter win, will run on, on whatever we point uh, it to using their source stack. And this will be like, for example, the file name. And in our case, we had the files, right? And the script will automatically add PHP at the end, so we don't need to add it. And then what the content of, of this file, which is read from the file, will be actually run through, will be run through this, which is the filter, and it will encode it in base64. And then it will include it, which is probably what we need to leak at least the code, maybe not not to execute it, but at least to leak it. So let's try it and uh, where is my browser? Yeah, and we already have something. So let's just copy it. And I'm going to put it in another file called files um, php b64. Okay, so I copy pasted it and there's some diff at the end which I don't not like. And now I need to decode it. How to best decode it? I think on Linux there was like a comment for it. Base 64. Base 64, yeah, there is. Hello. Let's see how does it work. Can I just cut it? Uh, no, it encodes. Can I decode? Yeah, I can decode, which is perfect. Um, it says invalid input file. It's probably missing the. Um, um, equal signs at the end, but we don't really care. So files PHP and we have the first file leaked. So this is a file. Okay, and there's nothing really here, right? So whatever PHP files are there, in this, in this, well, we we pre we are pretty sure there is index.php, so we are going to leak this one. We're pretty sure there is whatever handles the upload. Um, upload. So it's just called upload. So we're going to leak this as well. So let's uh, let's just do it. Now let's start with uh, index. Okay. So this is whatever is for for index. And I'm creating again a file of screen which is called index.php b64, and I'm going to remove the diff from the end. Okay, Kshaku says there's a question. Um, can I sa solve Labyrinth CTF reverse engineering challenge? Because I can't even... <laughs> okay, um, so generally yes. If you could send me an email to ginvale at coldwin.pl with a link to the challenge, I might want to try it on some other stream. Uh, now, that being said, I will probably on the next stream, which will take place in next week, I will probably do the continuation of the second challenge I'm going to do today. So the, the crack me from Z3S. And after that, I already have a plan to do Pico CTF from PPP, uh, some challenges from that. They're, they are said to be really easy. So I plan to go through a lot of them, well, a couple of them at least during the, um, the stream. But after that, I don't have any plans. That being said, uh, you probably know, well, there is the Black Hat and DEF CON conference and there's the DEF CON CTA, which I'm and my team, we are going to, there, to to Vegas. So I will be like away with without streams for a week or two. But after that, I'll, I'll go back to, to well, streaming again. Sweet. So we have this and we I want it also upload. And again, I'm copying this. I said I'm copying this. Come on. Yeah. Okay. And off screen, I'm creating the file named upload php b64 okay and I remove this oh there's actually like a sign here proper sign okay let's start with upload uh, okay and then index yeah, again i'm ignoring the error like invalid input it's not invalid it just says like either i'm missing a equal sign at the end or it has uh, which is probably not it. Probably it complains about the new line character. Does ASP.NET have something similar to PHP filters? I actually have no idea. I like in all my security career, I, I never played with ASP.NET. I played with ASP, the old one, but not with .NET. So no idea. Um, okay, so the files. Let's start with index. 
index is blah 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 HTML code, and then we have this, which is if in the session there are files, there are no files, then it's an array, and then the default page is upload, and then it just includes the page. So this is the bug which we are basically exploiting right now to grab the source code, right? Which is good. Mm. So let's see the upload file now. Oh, okay. I can already see it has like more PHP code than all the other files combined. So what's happening here? Why did it deny our... Um, okay, so there are some functions. Uh, zip OK does popen. Popen actually executes this process, this shell command, which is zip check and some... and a path, and it uses some escaping, which is not good. And then it closes it and it checks if p close returns zero. So it probably what does p close return? I'm I'm thinking it's the exit code of a process. But I'm going to check it. So p close is returning termination status minus one if it was an error. So I guess terminate termination status means really the exit code. Sweet. So then we have random ID, which looks like generating a random ID, which is like crypto save. And then we, okay, so our zip is written with whatever name, and we probably don't know this name at the, when it's uploaded, right? We just get to know it afterwards, and it's already there, and it's properly verified. So this is something to keep in mind. Now, mm, and it puts it in uploads directory. Hey, there's an uploads directory. Let's, let's see where. Yeah, okay, and indexing is turned on, so we have access to actually all the zip files, which we already uploaded, which is good. Okay, if this is something, I, in all honesty, I don't remember if the original challenge had this indexable, so I'm not going to use it, actually. But let's not use it unless we have no other options, because it might be cheating a little versus the original challenge, but, um, well... I didn't configure the server for the original challenge during the CTF, and uh, but I had to do it now. So this is the default setting for some reason for indexing, showing like an indexes of files. Um, <laughs> okay, and then it does something, something, and where is this called? Oh, it's here. Okay, so. It checks if the file is an uploaded file, and then it actually runs this zip check thing. What is the zip check thing? We're going to try to attempt to download this file. Okay, we can download it, which is perfect. So, um, <laughs> question number 1078, where did it get downloaded? I don't usually use Firefox, I use Chrome, so I have absolutely no idea what paths does it have. Okay, so it was downloaded to like the default system download directory. And I copied it here and file zip check. It's a uh, not, not stripped 64 bit binary. Let's run, we, we might have to reverse engineer it, but I don't know, let's just uh, try running it on xxx and try, see what was the error code, that's okay, and let's run it on ASDF and it's one, so uh, it seems to be looking for PHP files, that's my impression, but we can also run strings on it, it's actually like a huge file, I, I didn't show it, but it's like two megabytes, so I'm a little reluctant to run strings on it. Um, but I did anyway. So yeah, a lot of useful strings. Let's start at the end, the most. Um, okay, so it's it's written in Go, which is perfect. I would not like to reverse engineer stuff in Go today. It seems it seems to be using like zip from the Go. I actually have absolutely no idea about how Go's zip library works, but hopefully there will be no no. Not too many problems with that. Okay, and if this uh, says there is no PHP file, then it actually allows it to be copied and it puts it in our session. So this is how it works. So we have to bypass this check. So the great thing here is actually... Um, oh, we are still missing one file, by the way. 
we uh, we did not download whatever this is. This is show. Let's download show as well and see what's going on there. Again, I do not need this. Okay, Kshaku says, Oh, during the actual CTF, you couldn't download the zip check binary. Rev says it. So it was giving uh, 403. So this means I am not going to reverse engineer it. And uh, this is probably not the, not the idea, uh, um, well, about this challenge. So let's assume I never saw it. Let's assume I just know that it exists and go on from there and see what we can do. So again, off screen, I'm creating a show.php base 64 or b64 actually okay i copy pasted it and i'm going to do the um, base 64 thing again show okay and here we are what does it do oh it actually uses the zip archive class from php and it just lists the files, and <laughs> there is no XSS after all, it seems, which is it's so sad. Sweet. So, mm. oh, it opens, it actually could open any zip files. As you can see, there is no path, path travel style check, so we could open any file, any zip file we are able to, to upload. Actually, it doesn't even have to be a zip file. At this point we could basically just use some but but it does have to be a file. We can use path, path travel style but we cannot use like PHP something. Um, yeah whatever. Uh, we're going to upload our own zip anyway probably. So let's close it and uh, now what we have to do is we have to somehow bypass this check and we're going to um, when we bypass this check we're going to aim for creating a zip file which the PHP can open. So I, I did mention it, but I didn't show it to you. So let's go again for the manuals and uh, PHP zip um, protocol, I think it was called, yeah. For Zlib, but Zlib is not what I'm after. I'm after zip. Uh, I'm pretty sure there was a zip one. Yeah, okay, so, well. It's here. I just read this for some reason, but it's obviously here. So the way zip works, that you point it to an archive, and then you use a hash, just as you do use in. Well, you you have to remember it's not the same hash as used in the URL, but you use a hash here, and then you point it to a file, and it happily opens this for you. So we can use the previously found local file inclusion with this, like pointing it to zip protocol instead of a PHP protocol, and to our archive, which is in the uploads directory as we know now, and to some PHP file, which is there, and it will be executed. Now, does it have to be a PHP file? Yes, it has to have a .php extension, because as you know, as we saw in the, um, whichever file it was, I did close it already, I think it was the main file, the index file, let me reopen it. Uh, it did, yeah, it does add the PHP extension at the end. So if we put zip something, something, hash something, something here, it still will add the extension here. So we do have to keep, keep that in mind. And probably what the zip check is doing is just like listing the files in the archive and looking for PHP extension. And, and if there is one, then it says like, no way. So we have to bypass it around. Now, um, I'm going to go back to the file which I already downloaded, which is actually, oh, it's also not here. Mm. So I'm going to go back to this, my slides, because my slides about zips actually contain a lot of ideas how to bypass zip checks. And there is a funny quirk in PHP which we are going to abuse. Mm, let me just find the pres presentation which I already downloaded. Okay, here it is. Um, Blah, 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 this is like... Okay, so the... Mm, let's maybe go quickly through this, a couple of initial slides, okay? Because it explains the idea of most of the bypasses which uh, which we are going to try. So, as you might know, like zip starts with PK letters at the beginning of a file, which is totally not true, because it actually starts with... A, um, at the end, zip file, you parse a zip file at the end. You look for something which is called 
an end of central directory header which starts with uh, like pk and then there are like uh, 05 06 uh, i can actually make it even bigger for you guys can i make it full screen well it's somewhat full screen okay yeah and um this is important for one reason mainly you actually don't know where to look for this header. Now, I already said that you are looking for it at the end of the file, right? But that's not true. Uh, what is true here is that, uh, which I, I believe is shown in the end, is that this header, this is again the end of central directory, has two fields at the end, which one says what is the length of a zip file comment, and the other says, well, it's just a, like a byte field with of a given variable size, which is specified here, um, and uh, with the comment, right? With the bytes, uh, the text of the comment. Now, that being said, mm, okay. That being said, if you um, if you are looking for this, you you don't know if there is a comment, right? You can assume that there is no comment, but you, but there might be a comment. So you have to actually take that into account in your parser, and you you have to either like. Uh, assume at the beginning that there is no comment, that there is like this this field doesn't exist, there is no data in it at all. Or you have to, if you don't find the end of central directory there, then you have to assume that, hey, maybe there is like um, a file comment uh, of size one and, and look at the, again, recalculated position if there is the end of central directory there. And then you try to do it for like comment of size of two or three or four bytes and so on and so on to, to this size basically. And uh, this is one way to do it. And I, I think it's even shown somewhere here. Mm. Yeah, so again, these are like, uh, this is this way, which I described, like looking from the end, assuming that initially there is a there is no comment and then moving, increasing the comment size and still looking for the end of central directory header. Now, the other way is to actually look from the beginning of a file, like assuming that um, if I just look from the beginning of a file for the end of central directory header, I will find it at some point and, um, well, I will check if the comment size uh, plus uh, the position of it plus the size of a header is actually equal to the length of the file and if that's so, then that's the end of central directory header which I found. The other way to interpret it is that you start looking, assuming that there is like the header of the max, uh, sorry, the comment of the maximum size and then you are shrinking the comment trying to look for, at the end of the file to, to find the proper position of, end of central directory header. Now, um, okay, so, okay, um, Kshak could it ping me about what verse a comment somewhere, so I'll take a look later. Uh, I did, so if you were not here last time, the way I actually do these streams is I'm going to have a break in the middle, like in about 20 minutes, give or take, and then after the break we move on with another challenge, so, um, yeah, there will be a break. So, um, going further with this, you can actually uh, make a, well, you can actually check which, which, uh, you can make a file, a zip file, which has like a central directory, end of central directory header, which defines a huge comment. And in the comment, you put another end of central directory header, which has no comment at all. And uh, you can put this zip file, I actually called it abstract zip, um, resembling this abstract painting kitty, which is open for interpretation. And um, you put it to different libraries and whatnot, and you can see like which which library uses uh, which method. There are a couple of other ways to parse a zip file, like for, for example, from the beginning using a stream approach, which is not correct according to the standard, by the way. And there are like aggressive streaming approach. It means you just look for every file header in the zip file. But uh, let's focus on these two. So um, I actually asked a couple of people. Thank you, Mulander, Felix, Salvation, and Duro for, for um, running this in random libraries. Now, usually most of the software, what, what most of the software actually does, it, it reads assuming that the comment length is zero. So it looks uh, from the end of a file and then it stretches outwards to the, to the beginning of a file looking for the end of central directory. And most of software does it. I don't think, oh, we actually even have go archive zip. Well, I did already tell you that the zip checker is, uh, is a go file. So it also does this. It also does the, um, reads the end of, um, it starts at the end of a zip file, right? Now, 
there are some things which start at the beginning, looking for for the like, assuming that there is this huge comment and looking from there and then minimizing the comment up to zero and looking still looking for the end of central directory header. Now, um, well, this already tells you what we have to do, right? The zip archive thing is here, but also the zip wrapper, which we are going to use, which I already said we are going to use is also here. So this is the way we're going to, to go around it. Now, um, you can actually like, see that there are some other like streaming uh, libraries which look in a different place and uh, binwalk which is like basically a forensics tool anyway looks for everything and finds everything so you can look for my presentation there are some more details there and if you're interested in this let me know and i will do an english language presentation about zips in uh, on my live stream and in the future but this is already enough to to actually go about what we what we have to do so we basically we have to create a file like this right and it will be it will have to have um well two things right now i could just create the files from scratch but i could just download abstract zip and modify it to our purpose and i'm going to actually do do that so so let's do it and i can somewhere yeah i can download it here on my blog post and again, it got downloaded probably in a weird file. Now, um, what do you expect when I tell you that you that I just downloaded a zip file? You probably expect me to show you a zip file. Now I'm going to show you actually an mm, netwise assembler source code. And this is not true assembler source code because it's just like, it just uses the data instructions because I figured it out some time ago and actually Angela Albertini is, uh, has a similar um, approach to creating files is that assembler compilers are basically great tools for creating files from scratch. And if you actually look through like uh, smallest elf executable or smallest uh, PE portable executable files, you'll also see that most of them are created just like that, just like basically assembly source code, which is compiled into a binary file with no headers and the binary file in this case is a proper zip file. So, so yeah, so I'm going to just uh, reuse it and see what happens. Now let's start with doing, um, uh, let's start with doing uh, a few minor changes. Now, uh, I don't know if you know it, but zip files, in, in each zip file, basically there are two places where a file has a file name and one place is at the uh, central directory, which is basically like a central list of files. And then there is a file header next to the file data and it's the second place where a file name is set, uh, it's put. So um, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a file called readme start first. This is what PHP will see. And uh, then there is uh, another file, which is, and first, this is what the, um, the, go the go zip checker will see. So I'm actually going to just compile it and send it and show you that the PHP really shows me the start uh, file. So I'm going to compile abstract zip and it created again abstract zip file yeah here it is and i'm going to upload it now mm -hmm. okay and it's abstract zip it's here yeah it's successfully uploaded because why not and as you can see you can see the start first file however if we would do something like this if we would do uh, zip info, I believe, is the command, and it will list us the files which are in this. And zip info is basically from the unzip package, and it will say, tell you that the file is named actually end first, right? And these are it actually has even a different size, right? This is like uh, two three one, and this is two five nine. So, and you can see the are not really compressed. And uh, what we are going to do now is we are going to change the file name to .php, but not this file name because this file name is actually checked. Um, and we want the one which is not checked. Let's just name it .php and see what happens. And as, as, as I did say, this will have the same name is in a different place as well. So we need to find it and hmm, where is it? Start first. No, here it is, sorry. 
and uh, not end first. Sorry, uh, start first, obviously. Yeah. So here's one, and here's the other. Yeah. So this is the central directory entry, and the and this is the uh, the local file header, which is next to the data. So this is the data, right? And we are going to what are we going to do now? We are going to compile it again, obviously, and we are going to um, to upload it again. Do I need to? Rename it. No, I don't need to rename it, right? I just it's enough for me to upload it. Okay, and it's here, right? It's .php, so it bypassed the the protections. Now we can. Before I move to actually creating a shell, uh, let's just create something like this. Let's just tr see if it works. <laughs> okay. So maybe no view source. Let's do zip and what's the file name? Uh, it's here, right? Yeah, it's here. And we know that the directory call is called uploads. Uploads, then this, then hash. But I actually need to encode this hash because Firefox would treat it as like uh, like the end of a URL and it it would never be sent to the server. So what was the actually? I have actually absolutely absolutely no idea what's the. Uh, Sorry, ASCII or Unicode uh, character code for, for hash. It's 23. No, I actually did know it. So 23, and now I need to give it the name of a file, and the name of a file is obviously this, so let's see. Yeah. And it says, it's a uh, blah blah blah, failed. Oh, because it adds the .php extension, which I already showed you. So yeah, so it works. It displays whatever we have here, right? Start first, type extractor, type first, start first, type extractor. Jesus. Okay, Baron. Um, so now what we do, we need to change this to be some kind of a PHP shellcode. So let's do it. I'm just going to replace the data here. I, I will probably need to correct the checksums later on, but I don't care at this point. And I believe this is the, probably the smallest shell code you can get in. Uh, I don't want to change the size, that's why I'm overwriting it. One. Okay. Yeah. So this is probably like the smallest um, shellcode. You just like specify the function name and a function parameter like system, and it will run. So this should be should be enough. Let's recompile it and let's re-upload it and see what happens. Again, the CRC forty two the checksum is broken, but maybe maybe we will not have to fix it. Let's see what if it if something complains. Upload. No, it didn't complain. This didn't complain either. So. Let's just go back a few steps and replace the file name. So not here, not here, here. And let's replace this. How much did it select? Okay. Um, yeah, it said... Yeah, okay. But this means that it actually did execute the code. So what I need to do now is I need to do... Um, oh, these are not the parameters. These are the parameters. So I need to do ampersand zero equals and system and uh, one and equals like ls dash la. And as you can see, it actually works. It actually did list the directory. So we already are on the on the server. Oh, and there is this flag file. Let's see if we can just open it. Um, nothing is shown. So maybe we need to we need to leak it, but we are not going to use the old method. I'm just going to cut it here. Cat flag asterisk, and here's the flag. Yeah, I probably should have made it begin at the beginning. So it's yeah, dragon sector. Read me from the start, and that's the flag. And this is the end of the challenge. We would get, I think, like 200 or 300 points for it. So congratulations to us. And uh, yeah. Now. Um, I'm going to put this in the node files, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and I'm going to leave this, and we'll take a, a short break. But being said, before we go to the break, 
Um, everyone on the chat and on IRC, if you could write if everything in live coding is working well for you. So for the people who just joined us, I basically made a poll on um, on Twitter last time. Should we stay off li on live coding or should we move to YouTube, which has uh, some advantages and some disadvantages uh, versus live coding? But I did hear some opinions that live coding is not really working for some people. So if you're either on IRC or if you are on chat off, or if you are watching the stream like offline afterwards, feel free to uh, write on chat or on IRC if everything works correct. And if we, if you think we should move to YouTube or if we should stay on live coding. Um, also, if you are watching this uh, offline, then please just let me send me an email at Genvail, uh, sorry, Genvail at uh, coldwin.pl and tell me what you think if you had any problems with live coding or uh, did everything work correctly. And based on your feedback, I will basically decide whether we stay on, on live coding or whether we move to YouTube. So let me know that. And apart from that, um, let's take some break. Um, and then, yeah, after the break, basically, we we can go back to, to the second challenge. I will leave you with some music. Now, I know some people on Twitter actually asked me for donations. So there is a donation button somewhere there. But please note that uh, I am by no means a starving programmer. So if you donate, think about if you, if you actually should donate, whether it's better to just buy some programming books for your local community or um, like have a new by programmer friend and give him a, a great book on programming or buy him some some course or send him to a conference that might be a better use of your cash but being said some people ask me so where's the button um yeah so i'm leaving you for about five six minutes and we get back to the next challenge afterwards see you then and here comes the music
Okay, so I'm back, though you cannot probably see me yet. Okay. So, thank you for the feedback regarding live coding and regarding YouTube. I'm actually going to go through it after the stream. I did uh, look through the chat right now. Uh, there seem to be some voices in both directions, actually, which is good. Uh, one thing about I like about live coding is actually that there's the lag between me speaking to the microphone and you guys hearing it. It actually seems to be really slow, uh, really, really low, like, I don't know, five seconds maybe tops, which is not the case on YouTube. Um, okay, so this was the zippy challenge. Now, let's do, let's close this. And let's go for the other challenge which I planned for the evening, which was, or it's evening here, if you're watching in the US, I guess it's not evening for you, but it is evening for me again. Okay, and I guess I can close. Uh, I shouldn't have not closed one of these sites, yeah. So, um, as I did mention, if you go to my my blog again and the note about this session you can download the crack me here or you can just go to uh, zaufana trzecia strona which means trusted third party which is uh, which is uh, a great news site about security in polish um so bart uh, which is uh, he's a creator of p -Log, and he's actually um a, a really well-known uh, reverse engineer in poland so he created this crack me and um, there's a huge description in polish how to how to solve it i'm not going to read it and i uh, i didn't read it before the stream so i'm going to go blindly after this crack me which means i do expect it actually to extend beyond the stream probably during the next stream and maybe even one after that i will still be still be solving this crack me so um yeah so that's uh, that is how it will go Okay, I need to create a new directory. I don't even know if it's like Linux or, win or Windows, but knowing about it's probably Windows. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's a password on the archive. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, where's the... Okay, no, mm, there's only a password for the CPP for the source code, so there's actually I can still unpack the executable. Okay, I didn't mean to do that, I mean to meant less. Okay, so, uh, so this is good. Then there was a readme file. Let's look, I, okay, I extracted it as well. Let's look at it. So you might be wondering why did I type cat on Windows console and there's, uh, I will just uh, let you know quickly but there's something called uh, GNU Win32 and it's like basically Linux tools compiled for natively for Windows. It's better than Sigwin or whatever which are like basically environment emulators and these are native tools. So I use them quite a lot. There's like grep and other stuff as well here. Anyway, uh, it says um, mm, find the flag and uh, conquer the world and but it was created for the trusted third party site sweet uh, so it's windows um let's run it and uh, it says that i need to enter the secret password again it's a polish crack me so that's why everything is in polish and i i did say this and it tells me a hint um create a breakpoint on exit process function Okay, that's uh, well good. We have we have <laughs> some knowledge already, and it's a 32-bit executable, so it's going to be 32-bit, uh, no no 64-bit stuff. Now about the tools I'll be using, I'll be using the Binary Ninja because uh, I I l first of all I would like to try it out, and second of all I'm actually uh, well I know that Ida is super expensive. And I actually do have a license, that being said, I know that it's not easy for everyone to like come up with like whatever 500, 800 or 5,000 euros or dollars it costs, uh, depending on the configuration of the idea you want to buy. So I tend to try to use alternative tools. Binary Ninja is currently in beta, it's closed beta, but 
I don't know if you guys saw, but uh, under the video on YouTube from my last stream, the Cyphertex, which is one of the authors of um, Binary Ninja, actually came in and said that uh, he invites, like, grants licenses for the closed beta for anyone who subscribes to their mailing lists. That being said, he also said that the closed beta is ending soon, so if you want to try Binary Ninja out, then you have to be fast about it and you have to probably go now and, and sub subscribe to their mailing list. Now, um, after afterwards, after its release, uh, it's going to still be cheaper. I think the personal license is like 100 bucks, bucks which is also a lot in some countries still, but um, it's way cheaper than IDA. So uh, we might get some value out of it, which is which is great. And I also do like the theme. <laughs> anyway, if uh, for some reason I will decide that Binary Ninja doesn't actually allow me to do what I want, then I'll switch to IDA, but currently I'll stick with Binary Ninja. Okay. So, what first? Uh, I actually tend to do something like this. There's this tool I created called ENT, which calculates the entropy of each block of 256 bytes. Now, and it generates a PNG, and the PNG looks like this. Let me maybe make it a little bigger. Now, what this tells you is it tells you whether the file is... Uh, it tells you two things. It tells you whether the file is um, compressed or encrypted in a non-trivial uh, non way. If it would be, then these bars would be red, basically like in the red, like somewhere in the app here. They are not. Which means it's probably not compressed, not encrypted, or it's trivially compressed, like XORed with one byte, basically. Um, so this is the first thing it tells you, this, the second thing it tells you like how much there is code, this is code basically, which is the green section here, and this is some data, it might be anything, we'll, we'll have to look at it probably later. And uh, it also might show you if there are like red peaks somewhere where there is encrypted data, or like cryptographic constants or whatnot. You can actually look look up with this tool on my, my blog. So if you type Ginvale and, and like, you know, there are like three creatures from Tolkien, or like Entropy, basically. Um, yeah. And then there you have it. You can just download it with source code. It. It's, uh, yeah, and he, here's like the, the red parts I mentioned, right, on the chart. That being said, it's not a great tool, and there are like other better tools probably out there for Entropy, but yeah, I created it, I know it, so I know how it behaves. I know that each bar here is 256 bytes, so if I see a red peak, I can say, like, click here, multiply the x axis with 256, and, um, <laughs> and actually know the offset, and so on, so it, yeah, that's why I'm using it, basically. Uh, what level of encryption I'm looking uh, for or looking at? Uh, basically, you know, like uh, some executables tend to like have a short snippet of code which basically like decrypts something. And by encryption, I actually mean anything. It's, it could be like I don't know, XORing. It could be compression, like Zlib style, like UPX uses, for example. Um, as in compression, like UPX uses. I don't believe UPX uses Z Zlib. Um, or, or like. AES or whatnot, but that is rarely used in case of uh, executables because there is no need to. Like, if, if you have to put the keyver or part of the keyver is like, it doesn't make sense to use a, a slow encryp encryption algorithm anyway. Uh, it would make a great IDA plugin. Uh, that's actually true. I never thought about it. That's, that's a cool idea. Mm. So we already know it's not, it's not, uh, sorry, encrypted or compressed. Now, the, the second thing I do usually is like go for strings, right? So, uh, this is the first file. However, this only looks for like ASCII strings or UTF-8 maybe, but I'm not sure about it. And you can also make strings uh, go for, um, for, for like uh, Unicode, but 16-bit encoded, which is used on on, on Windows, on older Windows, it was UCS2, now it's UTF-16, obviously. So it's dash E, and then uh, little endian, which is uh, what we want, little endian 16-bit UTF. Another file name again. So this, and I'm actually going to append it at the end of, oh no, maybe not. Maybe I'll just create another file. TXT, but with you at the beginning. 
Okay, now let's see. Actually, the files are super small. So this is the first um, boom boom lip lock song. Is it something I can play on stream? Or is it something from the other side of the internet? Uh, so this is the first file and this is the second file. Okay, so all the strings are actually unicoded. And there is like, <laughs> what's up doc? This is what's up doc, you know, from the Bugs Bunny. Um, then, okay, correct flag, something, 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 secret. Not this time, my friend. Um, oh, there are like a couple of tips. So we only saw one tip. It seems there are quite a lot of tips. There's like uh, run soft eyes and press control D. Then you can use JAT, <laughs> the compiler. JAT is for Java, obviously. I don't believe this is Java, though I don't know, maybe. I didn't look at the imports yet. Maybe it like imports with Java Virtual Machine and there's like a part of Java there. Um, seriously, uh, really seriously, look at the offset, blah, blah, blah. Um, this uh, crack me looks better in a hex editor. Use a network sniffer. I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I would use d4 dot first. <laughs> Decompile this file with the reflector or dot pick. Actually, it seems that these tips have nothing to do with the crack me itself. They are just like you know a smoke screen. But they are a really nice collection of of names of the tools you use for different technologies for reverse engineering. Uh, let's see um, if there is anything really interested here. Like I just do a quick scan without. Um, this exists compressed with UPEX. No, it's not. It, it, it says that uh, you just can't see it. Okay. Um, I recommend using Hopper Debugger for this crack me. I would not lie to you. Um, yeah, right. This is some old school debugger recommended right here. Then there is like uh, password is add this offset. No, it's not. Or is it? Yeah, and then there is like a, uh, basically an advertisement. If you're Polish and if you understand Polish, actually do look at the site. Uh, Bart has some really cool stuff there. And he, he recently put even more stuff there. So it's pretty awesome. Um, okay, so Safira on IRC actually said that he created his own tool for measuring entropy. Let's look at the result. Uh, so I guess this is the same file we are looking at. I have absolutely no idea how to read his chart, but um, here it is. Uh, I guess it's color coded as well. It's it's nice. It's like abstract painting. <laughs> I guess it requires a tutorial just as mine does, like how to read it. Okay, so these were the Unicode strings. Now let's look at the other strings. Now I'm, I actually start usually with strings because it might tell you something about the technologies. Okay, this looks like I don't know, look like a check some maybe MD5. Probably not of a password because why would it? Oh, it, it just finds this site. I'm not going to look at it because it will be uh, there, are, there are spoilers there, right? Then it was created probably with Microsoft Visual Compiler and the symbols. We obviously don't have the symbols, so um, so that's that. Then there are some stuff. I would be seriously worried right now if this would be a pwning challenge because encode pointer is not something I like to see in an executable in the code pointer, but okay. And uh, then we have output the back string, that's funny. Get clipboard, open clipboard, and then there is some, this is like a crypto API. Then some randomness and some C functions. Nothing super fishy or weird at the first sight. Well, except for this boom boom lick lock song. Mm. LSD entropy. <laughs> okay, so Sophia says uh, dark colors indicate high entropy uh, and light colors indicate uh, low entropy. Okay. Fair enough, well, it's, so it's basically similar in, as in my case. So, okay, let's see what's going on here. So we are at start. Start is probably not main, right? Uh, it doesn't look main-ish. Where does it go to start? This is C exit, so maybe somewhere here. This is start. Uh, is it start? Might be start. Memset, memset, memset. Query performance counter. So query performance counter. Oh, when it 
What does it do? Oh, that's funny. I, I'm wondering if I really I'm looking at the proper code right now. How long is this function? It's not super long. Oh, there is this string. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm looking at the at the main function right now. Now, one reason you'd use uh, like something like query performance counter and or query well, this is for frequency, but usually you use query performance counters for to see if like if you have like one point in the code and then you have a second point in the code and the execution actually in the flow, right? You see what's the time distance between them because you know the CPU actually executes code or calculations really fast, so uh, usually it takes like you know like a millisecond is like a huge number actually in terms of how many cycles you can go through. Uh, in case there are obviously like uh, you know thread switches in between, then uh, that's another thing. But uh, and and the distance in time grows. But you can actually try if, and say like, hey, if it's actually more than one second, then probably somebody had a breakpoint somewhere here, and um, and like the debugger is attached. Therefore, well, let's 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 make fun out of him. Let's say that no, no debugger. So let's say like let's redirect the flow of a program to some other area. Um, anyway, I'm going to finish the stream in 14 minutes, which means I'm probably not going to be able to solve it. Uh, okay, this is funny. This is like, like homemade crypto, which you usually see in in crack me's. Um, this might be important, or it might be some obfuscated calculations as well, some other. But uh, well, usually you don't obfuscate anything, which is not not important. Mm-hmm. Vendors set. Console text. There's print. And another print. Set console text gotcha, but this, did it really change colors? Maybe I did not notice it. Let's scroll up. Oh, it does, does change colors, okay. Cool. So yeah, so this is the main function, I'm convinced now. Can I can I actually rename it? Let's see if I can rename it. I must admit that I never did rename things in binary ninja yet. So let's, yeah, it uses also like, uh, why does it use randomness at all? That's also a good question. Um, what is this function? So if you're wondering what I'm doing right now, it's I'm, I'm not actually doing anything yet. I'm looking around. So I'm trying to like get to know the structure of uh, of a binary to get to know what functions are there, are there, how deep are the functions, how large are the functions. I'm not analyzing them yet. I'm just looking around to get to know it. So uh, when when I actually, I also tend to note interesting places like the, the math one there, or for example, this one might be semi-interesting as well. Uh, um, or it might be, I don't know, it might be, for all I know, this is also just a uh, we saw jumps over on a loop. If there was a loop, I would say it might be like division of two sixty-four two bit numbers because that's usually a separate function. Okay, he does use randomness here for some reason. Oh, he, I, I know he's on chat, so he's probably like really laughing right now, but uh, I, I guess it's pretty. You don't see too often somebody trying to solve your own challenge unless you're a CTF team and you're trying to test it. Okay, so we call. Call ESI here and here. There also uh, seems to be a lot of randomness. Reset event. I have absolutely no idea what reset event does, actually. Uh, let's look it up. So, as you actually know, the MSDN. MSDN.microsoft.com is actually the the portal you go to for reading stuff about Windows. If you're new to reverse engineering, it's like you have to get used to it. Okay. Um, says the specified event. Oh, so okay. So it's event as in synchronization object. Okay. I was thinking of like, you know, like API. Uh, sorry, graphical interface events or whatever. No, so, so this is just for like a synchronization object and event. Mm, then it does mem sets, which basically push EAX. Why does it push EAX? 
Yeah, yeah, x is like this thing, which is zero. Oh, it, it reads the data from there. And it mem says that it like puts a lot of stuff in. Oh, so what was this ESI again? Was it random again? Yes, it, it is random. So it puts stuff in memory. I have absolutely no idea yet why. It does look funny though. And it does, so it does a check. And in case this check is not, is either met or not met, it goes around it and it never pushes stuff to memory. Why did it put push stuff to memory at this location anyway? Is it okay? One thing I'm, I need to do right now is actually open the executable file and see what's the difference between well, where in the virtual mem memory is this placed. So this is a P view, which is one of many executable file explorers. And what I want to do is I want to look at the section header and see at the. Um, no, I want optional header. Uh, okay. Doesn't like it for some reason, but it doesn't matter. The program will survive. I'm looking for base image. Image base is zero. This is not something you usually see, which probably means that yeah, it has you know relic relics, which I guess this section proves that there are relocations here. So, for all I know, this is actually like some memory area, and it it does something with some memory area. Maybe that detects a debugger and then it clears some areas of important code or, or something. Um, okay, so Dohan says that binary ninja can show you the binary and you can do it in the right corner, right lower corner. Uh, how can I... Mm. Maybe this. Yeah, okay. So it sh it indeed shows the binary, but not really in the way I would like it. So Dohan, do you know if if it actually uh, can show you know the optional header or the other headers from an executable? <laughs> so the offer of the challenge actually says that, uh, hey, no hints, by the way, I, I want to solve it myself. He says that uh, it um, it's painful to watch when I'm using binary ninja and I should switch to IDA. No, I don't really want to switch to IDA because if I would switch to IDA, I would just like press a five and have a nice C listing, which is, I guess, not the point of this exercise. So let's... Uh, yeah, let's keep going. Let's see what else is down here. So one thing which is interesting is like uh, if it really does zero out some memory areas, right? What what memory areas are these? And what I'm going to check. Well, zero. It doesn't zero. It, it randomizes. It seems. This uh, sixty-three eighty. Where is it? Okay, so is this is data section. Uh, how long is the data section? It's not really long. Friends versus TLS. Speaking of TLS, um, why is there TLS here? Usually, if there is like some TLS stuff. It might mean that something is happening before the executable, you know, the start is launched because there are some TLS callbacks in the PE files, which uh, means that. Some code might be run before the main function is actually run. It's like a similar mechanism to like import DLL mains are run before the main executable is run at all. Hmm. Doesn't seem this uh, this application is really useful in this case. What I want to see is I want to see this TLS table at this offset. Um, so it's error data and TLS directory and address of callbacks is here. 4170. Mm. So this is, uh, no, I actually want RVE 4170. This is it. 
So 20 to 10, this might be a function which might be run before it, I believe. It is just a pointer. I think it's just a pointer. Let's, uh, let's see. 20 to 10. Um, then 20 to 10 is somewhere here. Hexadon, I don't know that hexadon here on the disassembler. How do I make it view in disassembler age? Not within a function, okay. Um, yeah, I guess this is the moment when I'm switching to IDA. Uh, okay, so... <laughs> just as I said it, Shaku said that I should click something. Okay, it does work. B. So this is a code which is executed before main, if I understand it correctly. Let's see what it does. We can actually do analyze it. Um, which means I'm not switching to IDA yet. Thank you, Kshaku, for being there. There was an option to actually see, yeah, low-level, um, like, intermediate language. So this is like a frame stack. I actually have absolutely no idea what a callback gets as an argument. Doesn't might not mean anything. Okay, then FS base plus 30. What's, what's there? Isn't this like the... What's it called? Is the bugger present? Let's. Uh, I'll copy to this, the same directory a file from the Windows, and we'll see in IDA. Hmm. Where is it? Windows syswo uh, forty six, and the file which I have in mind is ever kernel thirty two, or it's kernel base. Well, one of these two. And what I want to look at is I want to check out whether mm, okay I just starting I want to check out whether like this is the address which checks if the debugger is present. I'm usually so a lot of people will actually already be using a debugger. I tend to attach the debuggers rather slow because I'm not really um, I'm kind of worried that there will be some mechanisms which will break stuff if I attach a debugger. So I tend to do checking before that. Is the bugger present stub? Okay, since this is a stub, it means it's actually implemented in mm, the other file, which is kernel base DLL. Okay. Okay, and this is the bugger. Yeah, so is the bugger present is just checking if in the whatever FS is pointing to. What FS is pointing to is called the thread environment block. If you're reverse engineering on Windows, you probably know about it. It's like each thread has its own block of some data specific to this thread. And there's also one block specific to the process, which is uh, both are maintained by the kernel. Um, I think if they are maintained partly by kernel, maybe partly by, by you know, the low level API. Anyway, so. It just checks if there is, um, it grabs a pointer at this address and then it loads from from that pointer, it loads uh, a byte and uh, to EX, like from plus two, which is PEB. Okay, so this is PEB, which is process environment block. And in PEB we have this, uh, again, if you're new to reverse engineering, if you look for process, and the Viron man block. You can you can see its structure. Its structure is well defined on undocumented APIs. I think this is the best site to look at it. Yeah, and being debugged. This is exactly plus two, right? So each boolean is like one byte, and this is the plus two. So basically, what it what the tab checks is it checks whether a debugger is present, and this check is done here. Mm. Or is it? No, it's not. Mm, let me switch again to a, sorry, yeah, to assembly. It would if it would check EAX plus two, but it doesn't. It checks EAX plus sixty eight. What's sixty eight? I, I have absolutely no idea what's sixty eight. And then it tests whether it's uh, seventy. Um, whether whatever is under that address is seventy. Why does it? Yeah, I, I probably should not be looking at this too much because you know since image base is zero, it does assume that it. It's about these strings, it's probably not about these strings. And then it jumps into sleep with some huge number, if this is true. I probably should launch at this point. Uh, what's it called? 
the WinDBG and try it, but I don't think I care enough. Yeah, whatever. Uh, let's see how it behaves. If it really freezes with a debugger attached, then we'll know it's something for to detect a debugger anyway. I'm going to start with GDB and see what, how it reacts to GDB, and I'm going to run it, and it fro throws. Oh, and I press Control C, it actually. <laughs> that's funny. If I hold Control C down, it actually doesn't spawn just new threads. That's that's neat. So I'm going. I'm actually in Conemo. I don't mind too much. I press Shift, Window, and Delete, and I close it. So we already know how it reacts to um, how it reacts to the uh, debugger being attached. Let's see if we can do something about it. Question number one: Where is my console? Here it is. Okay, never mind. I'm going to make a copy and we'll do some patching. That being said, I might be like even not. I, I'm pretty sure I'm looking in the right spot, but. There is a chance which, like, but this is totally unrelated. This is like some compiler stuff which I didn't see in a long time because I didn't do some any Windows reverse engineering in the last few years. So new compilers might just be adding it, and I'd be like, you know, looking at completely different part of code. That's kind of okay. It's it's kind of to be expected during reverse engineering. Like, um, during competitions is really annoying, but it happens. But you like go deep into a function, you analyze it, and after like two hours, you say that oh, this is actually C out from C plus plus, and it happened to me a couple of times on competitions. So, you you have to expect it as well. Okay, let's see if this uh, if I can patch in this thing. Mm, what do I want to patch? Oh, it jumps to this address. What's under this address? Um, I have absolutely no idea. Two 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 eight. Okay. Well, this is uh, sorry. What do I see the address which I have selected? Two two eight. This is not it. This is two two eight. Okay. So yeah, it was actually like a, even an hour away. I actually thought it was jumping out of a function. My bad. So this is infinite loop, which is cool. Um, what do we patch out? We can patch this out. Yeah, let's just patch it out, or we can patch this out. What address are you under? Actually, I'm missing pressing space right now, and I die would have a nice view of how the instructions like in. Uh, look in you know linear space, not in the graph space. So, so yeah. Um, what operating system do I use? So I use Windows and Linux, uh, which is Windows as a host and Linux as a virtual machine. Again, if you just joined us, um, you can go to my GitHub. So it's GitHub slash Gunvale, and there's this iFace, which is interface like Windows Linux interface thing. And at the end, there's a document with my notes how to set it up. And this is the code actually I use for RPC between the two things. So, so yeah. But it's uh, Windows 10 as a host and Linux as the guest. Um, okay, so let's go back to trying to figure out what was the layout of this. This is, uh, I actually don't think you can see it because my face is very, let's lift my face a little here maybe. Now here is the position in the file or actually in the memory where this is. Is it in the file or is it in memory? I don't know if it's in file in the mem or memory. I should assume it's uh, based on the image, so it's in, in memory. You know what, I'm actually going to switch to IDA, because in IDA I can see both and I know where it is and we don't have too much time left, so I'll just minimize it and I open the correct in IDA. Okay, so IDA even tells me that, hey, this, this is like a thread local storage table. Thingy, which is good to know. Okay. Yeah. So again, I was uh, I'm I'm trying to use binary ninja because both is cool and it's more affordable for a lot of people. But in the end, Ida is the fallback. So yeah. So what I can do in Ida is I can press a five because my license actually includes the compilers. So yeah, this is way more readable and way more faster probably to to execute. But again, we are analyzing something at two to eighteen if I remember correctly. Um, G two two one eight. Uh, sorry, what what? Oh, I actually did did I add one at the beginning? Yeah, so I had moved it out too. I think. Uh, let's uh, let's take a look in Binary Ninja. If you go to one hundred, 
uh, 31,000. Is it the same code? Yes, it's the same code. So I'd actually put it at the address like uh, with a one here, right? Like, so it's 10,000. So it seems the stream actually crashed right now, so I'm restarting it because nobody sees anything. Mm. <laughs> wow. Okay. I did restart the stream right now, guys, because it seems on the chat you say that it did crash, but it seems to be working now. Does it work now? Okay, if you refresh... Um, yeah, try to refresh uh, if it doesn't work for you. Okay, sweet. Let's um, let's get back to it. Then, okay, I don't know which part of the cra the steam crashed. I actually, you know launch it again in IDA and I found out just what the IDA is added. Um, put the text section basically like 1000 hexadecimal, sorry, 10,000 hexadecimals by later. So all the addresses I know, I actually need to add 1, 000, sorry, 10,000 to it, which is fine. Mm, I just need to remember to do it. So, okay, which, where were we? We were at this function 2, two. so it's one, one, two, two, one, oh. And again, this is the TLS callback thingy. Uh, let's call back thingy. Okay, I can patch by right clicking in binary ninja. Is that true? Let's let's see it. I am actually interested in this a lot. Patch convert. I can convert to no pay. Hey, this is this is actually awesome. Now, if I even it's even better if I can save it. Let's see in a sec if I can save it. Okay, can I save it? Can I save the file? Save. Save analysis, save file of content, okay. And it asks me, I don't know, let's call it X. Okay, so it seems to be patched now. I'll try to attach my debugger again and see what happens. Let's see if X works. Seems to work still, but it doesn't mean it works really, right? It means just that it we don't see it. it's not working. Okay, so... Honorary bot says that it's actually anti-global flag, the plus the thing which I just patched out, which is like this, it's actually anti-global flag thingy. Um, and it seems to be like a bit, the highest bit of the byte there, if it's set when a debugger is present, or when it's not present, but one of this thing. So thank you, honorary bot, but this is, uh, this is actually awesome for, for you pasting it on the channel. So now we know what what this does. It's as I anticipate is actually like uh, anti debugger, anti debugging trick. Okay, so let's attach the debugger and see if there might be more things which actually prevent the debugger from working. Yeah, there's this warning now like what's up duck, what's up duck, what's up duck, and it's not really working as you can see. Oh no, it is working, somewhat working. Um, okay, so. Can I increase font in IDA? Obviously I can, sorry about not doing it earlier. I think I can do it like this. Is it... I'm... okay. It's not readable too much, I would say. I absolutely have no idea why it... it uses a... Ho what? Okay, I think it, uh, it really uses monospace fonts for some reason. Can I change it somehow? Please don't use monospace fonts. Use this font. Okay, now it works. Okay, is it is it better? Can you can you actually read it? <laughs> uh, so about live coding versus YouTube, since I guess the crash on the stream spawned the discussion again. Um, again, uh, I did uh, I did the poll previously, but uh, I did ask again during the break whether we should stay on live coding, whether we should try YouTube instead. Uh, again, after the stream, if you have any comment on this, please comment on my blog or please send me an email. I will take on the, all the feedback I get into consideration and then I will uh, start uh, 
Well, I, I think it through. I discussed it with my moderators, and then we will decide whether to move or whether to stay. Um, so, question number 125. Why does GDB say what's up, Doc? So, I'm pretty sure I know. Uh, we did... When, when we did... Uh, mm, yeah, this is this. When we did look for the functions, for the actually strings, we did ma find output debugger string or whatever that function is called, right? Yeah, this. So the question is, I guess, where, when is it called? And it's called sometimes, it seems. Mm. And do we really care that it's called? We might want to patch it out just because as I would patch out some other stuff here. Uh, that being said, always remember that, well, it does say it's a crack me, but I would I am treating it as a Kagan me, which means I will try to find a correct key that works actually also in an at unpatched binary, so in the original binary. So while I'm patching here stuff uh, right, uh, left and center, basically, I will mm, try to, well, I will have to uh, use uh, whatever I find to actually have the flag working on the correct binary anyway. And this is just for debugging purposes and it's okay to do it. Um, sweet, so what next? Well, I guess I can read through the C code as I'm here already, right? So let's see, here's it's getting time, here's this actually initializing as rand, which I don't, I don't believe too much randomness is usually useful. Then there's like some stuff going on here. Oh, look, there's like some handles, some event stuff which are being being set or not being set, depending, I guess, on this part, which is like time measurement, whether it's larger than five. What does it check? Oh, it checks. Uh, mm, this is what the, what the measurement is doing, right? Yeah. So this is first the, the first measurement here, the second here, and it actually does, you know, um, well, calculates the delta, then divides it by whatever the frequency counter is, and then checks if it's larger than five seconds, and if it is larger than five seconds, then it goes into this funny stuff, which uh, does a lot of random putting random stuff in random places. So I guess if we would play a place a breakpoint somewhere here, or if this takes too much time, then this actually messes up with the memory and the crack me becomes not, uh, you cannot analyze the crack me anymore. So this is one thing we'll have to deal with somehow. Um, then we have, what is it? We have more of the same stuff here. And it has some like encode decode pointer. Then it creates a thread. So we have a new thread when the thread is. Oh, it actually decodes a pointer just here. No, this is. Uh, what is it? It's. Uh, I think it's not the right argument which I'm thinking about. Again, let's just jump to MSDN. So there are like two arguments in create thread which are really important, which is first is uh, parameters and the other is the start address. So the start address is the third parameter, not the fourth one. So this is, it calls decode pointer on, no, you decode pointer, what's pointer? Pointer is this plus 100. Mm, why is it plus 100? Okay, oh, and we already see like there's like enter a secret password, then there's something, something, something. Well, where do we enter the password? Oh, there's a get switch, which is like a safe version, and it reads the data. And it puts it in PB data, and it puts the length in V2, and if V2 is not non zero, then it has some funny looking constants here, and it has some math. This is probably the math area I, we did look at previously. Now, I, I'm wondering what this plus 100 here is, like an artifact from IDA, or is it... Or is it there? I don't know. Um, I don't care too much yet. I'll start to care about it later. Let's get back to that function, actually. Okay, so when it does this magic stuff, what does it do this magic stuff on? What are these? Like, so it uses these constants, right? So this is a constant, this is a constant. 
This is a constant. Does it use the PB data? What's the PB data? It's in the data section, so it's a global, global thing. Um, that's not what I wanted to. That's not what I wanted. What I wanted to press. Yeah, window management in, in either is also some something I don't fully grasp. It seems. Uh, oh no! So I did see this math stuff probably. Let's get let's get back to that thread thing. Mm, I somehow lost it. Here it is. Mm. Yeah, so if you have either of the compiler, it's like m much, much more easy to read the code, unless this code is probably much easier to read in assembly than it is in C. But uh, otherwise, yeah. Okay, so it then sets, it does something. There's like some crypto hash, which does something here. And then it creates well, it, a, a hex digest basically, and it compares it with a free, the destination buffer it compares with a free, and it returns whether it's equal or not. And there's another check here, which might be interesting as well. So yeah, this is this is an interesting part. Now what's? Sorry, Ida, please don't do it. Okay, what's happening later? Then there's this like again the query performance. There's a lot of this query performance stuff all around here, which does some random stuff to memory later on. But uh, again, since we are currently doing like a, we're not really using a debugger to look at it. I'm not using a debugger to look at it, so I don't really mind. And it's not an obstacle at this point. If and when I will have to use a debugger, then then it's another thing. So, okay, and then we get here, oh, sorry, where was the create thread was here. Then we go here again, this funny stuff, and then it tells our debugger what's up, duck, which is something I might want to patch out, as I did already mentioned. Then it waits for mul multiple objects, and it waits for six objects. So six objects, that's actually funny. I did see at least one. Oh, so it looks for the thread thing. So the handles thing is supposed to be, sorry, is, does it look for six objects or does it look, is it a memory limit? Again, I don't remember the order of parameters, sorry about that. I usually use out of MSDN in case of uh, Windows analysis anyway. Yeah, so it's a count. So, so yeah, again, handles is a, it's actually like a, a table, right? So we can, we can change it. And I, we know now that there are at least six of them here. And it one, what's what's one? Wait all. So it waits until all the handles are either finished or the event is set or whatever else. Hmm. Okay, um, anyway, uh, what is this function? It does, again, waits for some events. Th there's quite a lot of, like, you know, thread-related stuff here. I'm probably going to do something like, I'm going to uh, create thread. Is Gin going to come back here, or is it end of a session? Uh, So, okay, what what is this? Oh, this is just like uh, printf. So it says uh, fla flag is correct, and something something secret and something here. And this is actually I have no idea what some word somewhere in the memory, but it's supposed to be set to uh, to something. I will get back to it later. I don't really care at this point. Then we have another function called 
Oh, this is the crypto function which I already looked at, right? So isn't it called in a couple of places? It, yes, it seems it's called in the thread and it's called in also in the main function. Then there's this query performance stuff which messes with the handles and events. I actually should, uh, this events is also looks like it's like, you know, an array and not really one binary, uh, one, um, one variable. Then something happens, then it changes the color again, and something more happens, then there's the tip, and that's it. And you press a random key to actually get out of it. So this... Did we already find all the code? I don't know. What I would like to know is, like, uh, there are six handles according to this. Well, what handles are these? We already know is, like, this is one, right? So it's creating a thread, and it will it will like release the blocking wait for multiple objects only when the thread finishes. So this is one thing, right? Where are the other handles used? This is an interesting question. Well, not here, right? It's just like, this is anti-debugging code, what, what I'm looking at here. Another question is like, is it, yeah, these are like global variables actually. And there are one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, okay. And they are used in, and various functions actually. So how many create threads are there anyway? Oh, there are a lot of create threads. So it seems there are a lot of threads. Uh, only half of them are calls actually. Whoa, lucky us, so many threads. So it seems there will be quite a lot of reverse engineering here, even if we are only looking for the for the code, uh, for the, for the, like, um, so, I'm, okay, I'm curious if I should already start to crack the crack me or if I should actually continue analyzing it because I, at this point, I am more or less, I know what's going on in the binary with the exceptions of why are there six threads? I have absolutely no idea why there are six threads right now, but, uh, and why there are like so many events. So, but apart from that, it might seem that I might already be able to to try try looking at things if I can attack them one way or the other. Mm. Or whether I should still analyze, uh, like look around more, because the difference here is between you know looking around without really a purpose, just getting to know the code. And there's a difference between like actually going through the code and trying to understand what it does. And currently I'm doing the first thing. And it se seems, actually it seems that in five minutes I should be ending the, the stream. Then I'll just walk around a little bit more and on the next stream, which will be happening next week, uh, early next week probably, I'll, knowing what I already know from, to, from today's session, I go try and, uh, and solve this crack me. Given on the amount of code there is, I don't expect more than one more session will t uh, will be what is required for me to actually solve it. Now um, let's go. Let's get back to the to the create thread thing, and let's. Uh, uh, I'm going to look through all the all the functions which are actually called through this. So v1 is actually the code pointer with lp parameter. So this is actually it actually is called with here so is this this is one okay so like these are actually functions so is it a pointer to a function no how does it work create event is in a loop right but create thread is not in a loop yeah i'll just look through it and I figure it out later. Again, I'm not really reading the, I'm not really analyzing the code right now. I'm still in the recon phase when I'm looking around. So also one thing I'm looking at currently is whether ca can I attack this crack me using a side channel attack? Because usually on competitions, it's not about the proper, like properly analyzing the crack me, it's about getting the flag really fast. So one thing you try to do is doing a side channel attack. And a side channel attack is like, for example, checking if you if the final comparison or whatnot is done byte by byte and whether you can influence in somewhat predictable way like uh, the whatever is checked in the end byte by byte byte by byte because this actually allows you to to brute force the crack me byte by byte just comparison like the timing or the instruction count or whatever 
Now, because there are like six or seven threads here, I don't believe this approach would work really well because there would be a lot of noise in the timings due to the well the way the operating system operates, right? It just switches all the times between the threads, so it's not really not really a thing you could do here. So so no side channel attacks here. You you probably cannot use this approach, which is a shame. Um, both during the CTFs and during like some comp reverse engineering competitions, I did use side channel attacks, and they they are fun if they work. Mm. Okay, now what is this? This is getting funny. <laughs> this uh, colon here it seems to suggest like alternative data streams in in mm, oh my god um, in NTFS files. Basically, I don't know if you know. You probably know if you're interested in security, but on NTFS you can actually have. Uh, um, let's uh, let's maybe jump into Python. I can show it to you really quickly. You can open a file called ASDF. Um, to write, let's say, and you can write something there, and let's write there xxx, right? And now I'm going to close it, and now you can create an alternative data stream to the one which is already in the file, and you can name it something else, like xyz, and you can write to it. As you can see, it didn't fail. Okay, and now if you jump out, and if you actually like list the directory, right, you can see the asdf file, but there is AS no asdf uh, colon xxx, and if you cut it, you can see xxx, which is the first thing I've written, right? And if you cut like uh, xyz, you can you will see the alternative data stream, which is within this file. And you actually uh, notice that you can only see the files um, by default. You can only see the, f the size of the default NTFS stream, which is uh, data, I believe. This is uh, like two columns data. Yeah, this is the default. Uh, data stream which is in the file. So you can, you can think of a file like uh, that it can have multiple streams of data. Now, um, I believe there is actually an option in DIR to, to show you uh, uh, ADS alternative data streams files. And um, what I'm going after is I'm really surprised to see like an alternative data stream somewhere here, which makes this crack me even funnier. So I'm actually happy at this time that I did uh, go here because I did notice it. Um, how do you display alternative data streams? With, uh, I think I will have to just use Google. And there's the NTFS ADS. Uh, sorry, uh, P log says that it's slash R. Yeah, yeah, and here it is. You, you can see that this has like two data streams, right? Uh, data is like for, for data stream, basically. So again, the first one was like, uh, the normal file, file data is just this, and if you type xx uh, xyz here and uh, this colon hash data a uh, colon sorry dollar data it's you don't have to add it but it's the, the second stream you can have, have as many as as you like actually there was a time i think in history where antiviruses did not scan for alternative data streams and you can like hide your malware there i remember like it was i don't know 10 years ago or so um Okay, there's a question. Regarding timing attack and six threads, do you think that making thousands attempts of the same string and averaging the result would not give correct timings? Some people claim that timing attacks at insecure password comparison functions are possible even through the network, which adds more, more noise and jitter. Um, so, um, not really averaging the results, in this case minimizing the results, like taking the minimal values the way you'd like to go. But uh, what I would do is something else. What I would do is actually not not run it under Windows and the real operating system. Like I'd try to run it under some emulator, which and you which would allow you to run threads in a completely predictable way, uh, without you know no randomness uh, due to interrupts, due to other stuff. And because you would be emulating the instructions, you can count exactly how many instructions were executed. And that would be give you good results, and that's why you could you could you might be able to do a side channel attack even with threads. That being said, I don't have an environment with a good emulator setup to do this, and it would require some tweaking and some writing code, which I don't want to really do for this crack me, and I don't think is really needed. So I'm not going that way. Okay, so let's. Uh, I guess I'm going to finish in about two minutes. And uh, so again, today was more of a recon, not really solving the crack me and on the next stream, which I hope I will be able to do 
uh, somewhere in like really close and by close I do mean like maybe Monday, Tuesday, something like that to have in my head what I looked here, what I learned today. Um, okay, open clipboard, uh, get clipboard data, then compare it. Should I have this in the clipboard? If I have it in the clipboard, then uh, what happens? That's a good question. Maybe maybe it's like a like a really cool crack me, which you know requires to have something in an alternative data stream, like part of a key and everything to have like this to in the in the clipboard. And I, I'm really curious what the other stuff says here. Mm. Get version information. No idea why why does it do that. Set control handler. Okay, so handler handler routine is actually when you you know press control C or control break, and this is what gets invoked, and it sets some events of. Um, no, no, don't do that. Uh, okay, I'm not really happy how it how it jumps around. Um, where am I? Okay, I'm here. Where is the nice table with? of the handles yeah here it is so again here and i wanted to do is i wanted to press this like see where this this is actually used and it waits for single object maybe you also have to press something yeah we'll see so um what we know until now just to summarize it okay so there's one question you work at google with the same development environment yes basically yes um this is my go-to development environment uh, on book on google well it's more restricted actually and in, in due to obvious reasons in my work i don't want funny things to happen just because i made some some bugs in my implementation of rpc or anything so but apart from that it's the same environment um so to finish up what we know we know that this is it's probably not really an obfuscated crack me when by obfuscation what i mean is uh, compression there's like no second layer we don't have to unpack anything we don't have to dump any memory we don't have to rebuild imports at least it seems at like that at the first sight so this is what we know what we know also is that there are six or seven threads which we know need to go after which we need to which probably check different pieces of flag maybe and um, and well well we'll have to maybe have to analyze all of them and maybe they're just a distraction we you never know that until you finish right apart from that what we know is that uh, there's a lot of like this qu query performance counter trick which just like tries to um, grab your bro well if you go around placing breakpoints here and there it tries to um detect it and uh, basically make your life miserable so we if i ever would like to and attach a debugger i will probably need to hook this function make it return always the same thing maybe and uh, it might work like this unless there is like you know some catch where at some point it actually checks whether the the like uh, amount of cycles is actually like uh, somewhat proper and then if i patch it then it will give incorrect results so i will have to be careful around that um i did not see too much uh, of other um defenses here there's some math here and there which looks like crypto ish there's some yeah for example this this is uh, some more math which calculates some hash which i don't really know what hash is calculated here and it seems to this is the funny part, which I don't really understand. Um, but yeah. So, uh, there's some stuff related to math, and if it's visible, we can analyze it. We can probably derive some values which we need to enter or have somewhere there. We also know that there's this NTFS alternative data stream thing. So I would say that's about it for today. So thank you for, th thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Uh, again, if you have any comments on YouTube, uh, whether we should move to YouTube or whether live coding is good and we should stay and everything worked fine, then please let me know. Please either comment in my blog on, on the newest blog post on the English site or please send me an email at ginvale at colduin.pl or just catch me on IRC or just write your own opinion on chat. I will, I will read it. I do look at chat um, uh, now and again. Um, so, sorry. And I think that's it. So... Again, thank you for uh, you being here. Thank you. Thanks goes to Kshaku, who was my moderator today. Also, thanks go to 
um, Nervous Test Pilot, whose uh, music you will hear in a second again. Um, and that's it. See you, I believe, in one week tops, probably earlier than that. Watch my blog and watch my Twitter, and I will tell you when is it and what platform are we going to use. So that's it. Thank you and uh, take care. Again, try to fiddle with Crack Me, maybe mm, compare your method of solving it with mine on the next stream. So that's it. Thank you. Bye bye.